study of 2 Peter, and we'll be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Now, in uh, Peter's first epistle, his primary concern was to encourage the faithfulness of Christians who were suffering persecution for their faith. You might remember that. And now in his second letter, um, today, we'll begin to see his main concern is to remind the believers of the truth and encourage them to live a godly life so that they won't fall for the destructive heresies of the false teachers. So, uh, in the, so far in the first seven verses, we've learned that we have the power to make these changes because God has already given us all his rich and wonderful promises. Somebody say all. all. And as we know him better, as we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything. Somebody say everything. everything. We need for living a godly life. And then Peter instructed us to apply the benefits of God's promises to help us to grow by developing the seven virtues of a godly life. Those are moral excellence, knowing God better, self-control, patient endurance, godliness, brotherly love, and love for everyone, which is agape, or the God kind of love, right? And he told us that if we do these things, we will never stumble or fall away, and we would receive a grand welcome and a grand entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Now, in today's message, and, uh, I, I've titled it Life and Legacy, we find Peter is very intent on working hard to leave a lasting legacy of faith and faithfulness. Now, I invite you to stand with me, and we'll read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15 together. You ready? I plan to keep on reminding you of these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth. Yes, I believe I should keep on reminding you of these things as long as I live. But the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that my days here on earth are numbered, and I am soon to die. So I will work hard to make these things clear to you. I want you to remember them long after I am gone. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your holy word. We ask you to open our hearts to receive and quicken our minds to understand that the light of Christ might shine in and through us. In your wonderful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So uh, yesterday, we had a wonderful men's meeting, and um, we watched Top Gun out at uh, the Francis residence, and, and uh, we got to enjoy some good snacks, and, and really uh, that... Uh, that Georgia chili was amazing. We appreciate it, Georgia. Thank you so much. At the end of the movie, we had a little bit of a discussion. And um, what we talked about, you know, was being faithful to Christ, having the, having the courage um, to stand for the truth, having the courage to, to do the things that we're here to do while we're in this earth. And, you know, I, I, I always appreciate when men stand and, 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 and are courageous, right? do the things that need to be done. Well, part of that is because we currently live in a world that either doesn't believe in truth or believes truth is relevant and sub subjective. For example, we recently watched, uh, I, I mentioned this last week, but we, we recently watched um, a screening, I guess, called What is a Woman by Matt Walsh. And Matt traveled all over the world interviewing feminists, medical doctors, university professors, psychologists, and the like. And he was asking them a very simple question. And that question is, what is a woman? Interestingly enough, none of these highly educated people could give any kind of a definitive answer. And most just grew angry at the question. In fact, the more Matt asked, asked in simple terms, the further down the rabbit hole of double speak, avoidance, and confusion we went. All I could uh, be certain of is that if I were to stand here today and proclaim that I am a woman, many in the world would affirm my assertion, claiming something to the effect that uh, being a woman is a is a state of mind and a feeling, not a condition of human genetics and anatomy. Somebody say truth. truth. 
We need to stand for the truth. Amen. See, these days we have, this is just one thing, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to pick, out, pick on any per particular thing, but this is just one thing that we're dealing with in our society today, and we need to be able to stand for the truth. Amen. See, these days we have transgendered athletes in high schools and in universities, and they're competing against biological females, and they're winning because of the, phys the physical advantages of strength that they possess from having male chromosomes. Yeah. Those physical advantages are a fact because biology is biology no matter what you want, how you feel, or what you think. Now, that truth may not concern you right, may not concern you much right now, but it should. And likely it would. If it was your biological daughter who got pinched for a spot on the team or who was denied a title that she'd worked so hard for for years and sacrificed for, you see, unfortunately, a lot of times people won't get involved in even speaking about something like that unless they have some skin in the game. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to inform you today that you do have skin in the game when it comes to matters of truth because truth is not subjective and not confusing. Truth is fixed and informing. Yeah. If I told you there is a truth on planet Earth called gravity that pulls mass towards the planet's center so that if you climbed up on the roof of this building and stepped off of the edge, you would immediately begin to accelerate toward the planet until suddenly and painfully stopped by another truth called matter. And you didn't believe the truth of gravity or the truth of matter because you just thought they were subjective. So you went up and gave it a try. The truth of the matter and the truth of the gravity would quickly become evident to you and may indeed become the last bit of truth you learn on in, the, in this life on this earth. Yeah? Amen. Amen. Because gravity is a fixed truth that informs us that things on planet Earth naturally fall till they hit the ground. Yeah. And that's good information. That's good information to have because it teaches us how things work. And by understanding how things work, we're able to function without the destruction and the suffering and the loss that we experience when we don't allow truth to inform us. What concerns me even more than the person crashing down to the ground is the person that convinced him that gravity was relative or non-existent in the first place. See, because that person is causing great harm and will continue to do so until confronted and stopped. Sometimes we've got to stand for truth. Amen. See, you have skin in the game because what people think shapes society for the good or for the bad. Yeah. Peter's speaking of truth right now, right in his present time. He was speaking of truth at a time when the world was hostile toward the truth that he was speaking. Somebody say a godly life. Peter's instructing and encouraging people to live a godly life based in the truth of God. And he's unapologetic in his approach and determination to proclaim the truth. He's saying, I plan to keep on reminding you of these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth. Because truth is a foundation for life. So a life that leaves a legacy is a life founded on and lived in the truth. Yeah. The people Peter was speaking to already had a foundation of truth they were, they were building their life on. But he's reminding them anyways because he's concerned that the lies and the heresies coming from the false teachers may actually be believed by some. Yeah. So he's beginning his defense of the truth because he doesn't want any to be led astray by those same false prophets. See, when lies become so skillfully twisted around to sound like the truth, it, it begins to break down society because you're building on lies. Whether it's our faith in God or our belief in what constitutes being a woman, it's always the same. Building on lies destroys lives and society. Yep. Yeah. To illustrate this danger of, of deceivers who, who, speak, um, who speak lies... Uh, 
we're going we're gonna to turn to a very unusual situation during the reign of a king named Jeroboam. And you'll see how this affects society. After, this was after King Solomon's death. You remember when King Solomon died, the, the kingdom became divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms with the, the northern tribes becoming known as Israel and the southern as Judah, right? And Jeroboam was the first king of the northern tribes as they became called Israel, and he was a very bad king because he crafted these two golden calves and he told the people, these are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. Now, it may seem rather crazy to you that anyone would believe such a wild thing as some golden calves that we just made with our own hands being gods. I mean, doesn't that sound kind of crazy to us in our modern day, you know, thinking? And you may be tempted to think that they must have been complete simpletons to believe such a thing, but I'd say that we have a bunch of people believing even crazier things than that right now in our world. Amen. 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 And I wonder what future generations will think of our level of intelligence when they look back on some of the things that we've done. See, by his lies and his deceptions, Jeroboam moved the entire society of a nation away from the true worship of Jehovah into the false worship of idolatry. He built shrines and altars and ordained his own priests. He made the two golden calves and uh, uh, he sacrificed to them and he designated feast days and religious festivals that were in direct competition with the holy days and festivals that God instituted. It was a counterfeit religion based partly in true worship but ultimately was the beginning of idolatry and the ultimate des demise of an entire nation. All ten northern tribes eventually disappeared over this. So in 1 Kings 13, 2, we find that God defends the truth. He's standing against the lies and falsehood by sending a man of God to prophesy against the altar Jeroboam built at Bethel. Somebody say courage. courage. That's what this man of God is doing. He's going to prophesy against this altar. He's going to be taking his life in his own hands doing this very thing. But it's the truth that God wants him to proclaim. 1 Kings 13, 2. Then at the Lord's command, somebody say Lord's command. He shouted, oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense and human bones will be burned on you. Wow. This prophecy was indeed fulfilled some 356 years later when a child named Josiah was born to the line of King David. See, God knows the truth. Whether that truth is right now in this very moment or 356 years later, God knows the truth, right? And we do well to understand that God knows the truth. But sometimes people need a little bit of persuasion. So God gave Jeroboam a sign that what the prophet was saying was true. So go down to uh, verse 3. And he said this, The Lord has promised to... This is still the, the prophet speaking. The Lord has promised to give this sign. This altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. But see, Jeroboam didn't want to accept the truth that the prophet spoke. And he got so angry about that truth. And that's what a lot of people do when you give them the truth. He got so angry at that truth, he pointed at the prophet and he said, Seize that man! <laughs> Tell somebody, don't shoot the messenger. Amen. In society today, when you speak the truth from God, you get blacklisted, deplatformed, maligned all over social media. But Peter would compel us to trust God, be faithful, and stand firm in the truth anyways. Amen. Amen. And so as Jeroboam points and he says, seize that man, God stepped in. And instantly, his hand became paralyzed in that very position. Yeah. 
and simultaneously the altar split open, just as the prophet said, and the ashes all poured out as he stayed there stuck in that par paralyzed position. And then Jeroboam begged the man of God to pray for him. And when he prayed for him, his hand was restored, right? It's an amazing story that begs the question, how much proof of truth does one person need before they'll change their mind and live the truth? That's a good question. Yeah. Prior to the golden calves, Israel had known Jehovah God for hundreds of years. So they already knew that this idolatry was a lie, right? Right? That's the first truth. The second is this. Now in grace, God sent a prophet to warn Jeroboam and to try to turn him around, right? That's the second part of truth, right? He just, he just brought, sent him a man that spoke the truth to him. Man, when somebody comes and tells you the truth, something on the inside of you should be saying, yes, that's true, not going, no, I don't want to hear that. Amen. And then, and then thirdly, God gave him the sign of the split altar to show him that the altar that he built was a lie. So he can turn and embrace the truth. God's trying to get him to turn around, ain't he? Yeah. And then that was followed by the fourth sign, which was that paralyzed hand, which let him know that he can't change the truth no matter how hard he tries and no matter what lies he says, the truth is standing firm. Yeah. That's grace. And then a fifth sign was given in the healing of that hand. And that showed him that mercy and grace were available if he did what was right by receiving the truth, right? Yeah. yeah, that's all God was concerned about. That's five different proofs. So I ask again, what does God have to do to get us to turn from the lies and stand for the truth? The lies Jeroboam began right, right, right there, right then and there, became the seeds of the destruction of an entire nation down the road. Somebody say skin in the game. God was lovingly and graciously trying to turn them around, but they just kept embracing the lie anyone. Everybody had skin in the game because the truth informs us, and society can't stand if it's built on lies. Peter wants us to live the truth and stand for the truth. There have always been destructive heresies being preached since the beginning of time. It, it, it all started right there in the Garden of Eden when, when mankind decided to believe the lie of the devil rather than the truth of God. And the reason why they decided to embrace the lie was because the, the, the lie sounded good to them, didn't it? I mean, they looked at the fruit and it looked beautiful and, and it seemed like it would be tasty and, and, excuse me, and it was supposed to make them wise like God himself. But instead it brought death, didn't it? Yeah. Because it was a lie. And lies are always traps that take away the life instead of bringing happiness. Peter doesn't want us to fall into the trap. So he's reminding us of the truth by pointing at Jesus as the ultimate truth to build our life on. Yeah. See, in, in John 14, 6, you remember Jesus himself said, uh, he told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What Jesus says is the truth. It's not a truth. It's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's not relative truth. It's not subjective truth. It's the truth. Yeah. Now, some may say that's dogmatic. And I'd argue that so is gravity. But... It's the truth anyways. Yeah. Whether you agree or disagree, like it or don't like it, gravity is truth no matter what your opinion on the matter happens to be. You can say, oh, I feel like there's no gravity. But gravity is not going to care one bit what you feel because gravity is truth. And if you try to build your life on a lie or you try to build a society on those kind of feelings that there's no gravity, it's going to literally come crashing down. What Jesus says is the 
truth. And he said it's the truth, not our feelings that a wise person builds on. Turn over to Matthew 7, 24. You know it well. Anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is, what? Foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When it rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash. Here we have two different kinds of people who use two different kinds of building materials. The first is the kind of person who's humble and listens to God. He's the kind of person that, is a, that, that Peter is appealing to right now. That's who Peter's talking to, church. People who are humble. People who listen to God. The second is the kind who's proud and ignores God. We can compare him to Jeroboam, who wouldn't listen no matter what God did. The first listens and builds his life on the truth that Jesus, of Jesus' teaching, while the second ignores God and builds his life on whatever he thinks and feels, right? Jesus, who said, I am the truth, now speaks this truth. The first person's life will stand up against whatever is thrown at it. But the second person's life is going to fall with a mighty crash. That's the truth. Yeah. One leaves a legacy of strength built on truth, while the other leads, leaves a legacy of lies followed by complete destruction. I think we probably have all known fools before, right? We've seen the destruction that comes from foolishness. Yeah. That's the legacy that Jeroboam left. Lies and deception followed by complete destruction. But a life built on truth stands firm and leaves a lasting legacy of goodness. That's what Peter's encouraging us to do. Stand firm. So tell your neighbor, stand firm. Stand firm. Amen. Next in verses 13 and 14, Peter shows us that he plans on encouraging their faithfulness in the truth for the rest of his life by saying this. Yes, I believe I should keep on reminding you of these things as long as I live. But the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that my days here on earth are numbered and I am soon to die. That shows us the life that leaves a legacy is the life invested in others. Invested in others. Peter has revealed truth from God. He's got something God revealed to him, right? He knows he's not going to be around much longer. And that puts things in a very clear perspective for him, right? Right? That's what, that's what God's Word and His Spirit do for us. They reveal truth over the course of our life, and they put things in perspective, right? It, it happens over time. As we live and we walk out these, this truth of, of God, He reveals more and more things to us. Take a look at what Jesus said in, in John 16, uh, verses 12 through 13. He's speaking to His disciples, and this was just prior to Him uh, to the crucifixion. He says, oh, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not be presenting his own ideas. He will be telling you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Somebody say it's the word. It's the word. Firstly, I want you to notice that there's a component of timing at play here. Some things God will reveal later can't be revealed now because you can't handle it. Yeah. You can't handle it yet. Jesus told them there's so much more he wants to tell them. So much more. God always has so much more he wants to give you. But God is good and he won't share it with he won't share what you can't bear. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God only show, only shares what we're able to bear. You may want to know what your next career step is. You may, you, you, you may want to start this ministry and wonder when you're supposed to do it. Uh, he, you may be wondering where that spouse is that he, that he laid on your heart. But God's not, he's, he's not telling you about that. Because sometimes you're looking for answers that you can't handle yet. So God waits until the proper time. 
then it'll be a word in season, right? Right? So there's timing when it comes to the revelation of truth, which brings us to the next thing. And that is that for the rest of your life, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you is going to be to reveal truth so that you can learn what you don't yet know when you're ready to know it. Amen? If you'll, if you'll allow him, he'll show you things relating particularly to your life and to your ministry to others. In, in, in this particular case that we're talking about right now, with Peter, the Holy Spirit revealed that he didn't have much time to live. Now, that may not so seem like a, a very helpful thing at first glance, right? But it was time for him to know it. And that revelation caused Peter to become laser-focused on helping others stand firm in the truth. It was exactly what he needed then. It's amazing how clear things become when you don't have much time to live, right? Yeah? Puts it in. No one ever gets to the end of their life and says, Oh, I should have spent more time at the office, or I wish I would have invested more of my life on the golf course. It's not, that doesn't happen. The truth is, when we get to the end of our life, it's always about people, isn't it? The people we wish we spent, we spent more time with, the people we wanted to pour more into, the people, the truth that we wanted to share with them, the wisdom that you wanted to impart, the love that you wanted to give. It's always about the people, right? So now, toward the end of Peter's life, he has this revealed truth from God given to him, and it leads him back to that truth that it's all about investing in people. That, now, that was toward the end of his life, right? Toward the end of his life in ministry. But what about the rest of the years when he was walking with Jesus? Was there any revelation from the Holy Spirit then? There sure was. In fact, right from the beginning, he had revelation. You remember when Jesus said, Who do you say I am? It was Peter that said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, The Father revealed that to him, right? That's revelation that helps you directly. Because it reveals more about God. So some of the truth that God is, that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal is stuff that's meant to help you directly, right? Then later when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, you remember the people were, uh, heard, heard everybody speaking in tongues and some of them thought they were drunk? You remember it was Peter that jumped up and said, no, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, right? Yeah, that's revelation of God's word. And that helps others to understand his will and his ways, see? Yeah, that's more revelation. The first occurred when Jesus was still on the earth, and the second, 45 days after he, after he was resurrected. So now we see that Peter got revelation from God in the beginning and the end, right? Both times, right? But what about in the middle? Do you, do you remember the day when Peter was hungry, and he went up to the roof to pray? You remember while lunch was being prepared? You remember that? Then he got that revelation from God by way of this uh, vision in which something like a sheet came down from heaven and it was filled with all manner of unclean beasts and a voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And what was Peter's response? He declined, right? He's saying, never, Lord, never in all my life I've ever eaten anything forbidden by our Jewish laws. Now, now, now look at Acts 10, 15, 15 and 16. The voice spoke again. If God says something is acceptable, don't say it isn't. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was pulled up to heaven again. See, the timing of this revelation was impeccable because as soon as the vision ended and Peter was sitting there pondering and trying to figure out what it meant, some Gentile men arrived from Cornelius' house because two days prior, Cornelius also had a vision. And in it, he saw an angel who told him to send men down to Joppa to find Simon Peter and to bring him back for a visit, right? So the minute that Peter's vision concluded, and he's sitting there pondering it, these men show up, these Gentile guys, right? Jews aren't supposed to associate with Gentiles because any contact with the Gentile would ceremonially defile the Jew, right? But, but, but Peter accepted them and the request to come and visit because he got revelation of truth from the Holy Spirit. We got to live by truth. Let's, uh, let, now let's see, let's see what he got and turn over to Acts 10, 28. Peter told them, you know it's against the Jewish laws for me to come into a Gentile home like this, but God has shown me that I should never 
think of anyone as impure. Somebody say proper time. Peter lived his entire life in obedience to the ceremonial law, but now at this time, God was abolishing that law, and Peter was ready to receive it, so God gave it. Yeah, that truth at the right time led to the opening of the door of salvation to everyone. Somebody say praise the Lord. Because if it wasn't for that right there, you and I wouldn't be sitting here worshiping Jesus today. Yeah. Yeah. That first revelation Peter got was the truth about the Messiah, the Son of God, and that helped Peter directly. But that from that point forward, every other revelation of truth that Peter got from the Holy Spirit invested him in helping others. Yeah. Every one of them. And, and Peter is so convinced that this is the right thing to spend his days on earth working on that he says, yes, I believe I should keep on reminding you of these things as long as I live. That's the life that leaves a legacy. It's founded in truth and invested in others. Peter believes that even though they know the truth and are standing firm in it, he needs to help keep, he needs to keep on reminding them as long as he lives because Peter knows the destructive nature and allurement of deceptions that promise to please. He knows they'll only bring destruction. Whether it's Eve looking at the fruit or Jeroboam's people worshiping a golden calf, or any of the other insane confusion the false prophets of today's universities are propagating, believing lies always brings collapse and destruction. But building on truth brings stability and strength. That's what God's leading Peter to continue to sow into others, because that's love. Giving people truth is love, right? Yeah, amen. The truth... And the love you sow is what God counts as good. The truth and the love you sow in others is what God counts as faithful. The truth and the love you sow in others is what God counts as productive. The truth and the love you sow in others is what God counts as a legacy. So be faithful and invest in others by sowing truth and love because it pleases God. Amen. Tell somebody be faithful. So next, in, in verse 15, Peter shows us the effect of his effort is long-lasting when he said this. So I will work hard to make these things clear to you. I want you to remember them long after I am gone because the life that leaves a legacy is worth the effort because it produces beyond you. Beyond you. To set this up, I'd like to remind you of uh, the parable of the soil. You remember there was... There was the hard path, which didn't allow the seed to enter into the soil, like, like the hard heart that won't allow the word to enter. And then there was the rocky soil that didn't allow the seed to root very deeply, like a person who superficially accepts the word with their mind, but never really allows it to grow into their heart. And then there was the third type, which is the thor thorny ground, which had weeds that were growing up and choking out the good seed. That's like a person who hears the word but gets so busy with the world that it chokes out their productivity for God. And, of course, there's the good soil, right, which I, which I, want, to, I want to point out a bit of a nuance on right here now today. And I'm going to look at it in the Amplified because it kind of bears it out. Luke 8, 15 in the Amplified says, But as for that seed in the good soil, these are the people who, hearing the word, hold it fast in a just, noble, virtuous, and worthy heart, and steadily bring forth fruit with patience. Steadily bring forth gives us the sense that the fruit continues to come forth throughout the lifetime of the person, right? Yep. It's not just, not just one batch and it's all done. This is fruit that just continues to grow. But just like that fruit that falls from a tree, some plants into the ground and grows into a whole new tree that then produces fruit beyond the life of the first tree, right? You follow me? Yeah. So the productivity of the first tree lives beyond itself. Now, now look at Proverbs 13, 22. Godly people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. At first glance, this seems to be speaking specifically about money. 
But if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll discover it's more. And again, in the Amplified, it bears it out saying this, a good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Somebody say a godly life. Moral stability and goodness are exactly what the Apostle Peter is talking about because they're part of the seven virtues that he compelled us to build our lives on. See, the product of your moral stability and goodness is wealth you leave behind in the hearts of others. It's wealth you leave behind in the hearts of others. This applies to your physical children and to your spiritual children. Follow me? A good example of this can be found in the life of Timothy, whom the Apostle Paul mentored. Turn over to 2 Timothy 1.5. We're going to see a chain, of, a chain of, uh, of faithfulness and goodness here. 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul speaking, he says, I know that you sincerely trust the Lord, for you have the faith of your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. Here we see three generations of faith in God. It began with the godly life of Lois, who lived out her faith, causing it to become planted in the heart of her daughter Eunice, who in turn lived out that godly faith, causing it to be planted into the heart of her son Timothy. Yeah? Then Paul enters the picture, and he shares the gospel with Timothy bringing him to the complete redemption of Christ. Now, let's, let's look at the godly instruction that Paul gives Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Timothy, my dear son, be strong with the special favor God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach many things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Teach these great truths to trustworthy people who are able to pass them on to others. Timothy has become a pastor who now has the faith of his grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice flowing in him, along with the good news of the gospel and the teaching and the example of an apostle Paul in his life. That's a whole lot of fruit growing on one person, isn't it? Okay. Amen. Amen. And catch the instruction Paul gives. Teach these great truths to trust, trustworthy people who are able to pass them on to others. Saying trustworthy people brings the implication that they would pass it on to other trustworthy people, right? Yeah? That's, that's two more generations of godly faith that, that, that this is being reached, and the implication is that it's going to keep going. Buzz Lightyear has a favorite saying, to infinity and beyond amen what began with one woman named lois who lived a godly life of faith became an inheritance to her daughter eunice and was passed on to her son timothy and then went on to trustworthy people that then pl placed it on into other trustworthy people and and, and way beyond as Pastor Tim lived out the example of godliness and faith before his entire congregation. All that came from the inheritance one grandma left. Amen. One grandma. Lois left it when she lived out the truth in her time in this earth. She stood for the truth. She imparted the truth in her child. It's a godly life. It's a faithful life. It's a powerful life. It's a productive life. It produces beyond your years. It produces for generations. It's seed sown and fruit grown. It's the gospel of Christ lived out loud. It's the living word living life through you. It's the example given by the faith that you're living. You're, you are that city on a hill. You are the salt of the earth. You are the good soil. It's God's word in your heart. It's worth it. Because like Buzz Lightyear says, it goes from infinity and beyond because it will produce long past you. It's your legacy, and it's worth it. 
If you agree, tell your neighbor it's worth it. Amen. 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 Good word. You know, as I'm sitting there, what jumped out to me is being connected to people. That's how we're able to live a life and leave a legacy. You know, and you know, here at Grace Christian Family Church, we are about connecting people, strengthening families, and fulfilling purpose. But we got to stay connected to people. You know, last night, um, my wife and I, we went to a football game. And um, intense game right down the street here in Laurel Hill. Um, two um, of the best teams in this youth league. And, um, you know, I'm there with my buddy, my brother, back actually, and we're watching the football game. <laughs> we're into the game while my wife is like, 30 yards down on the fence, you know, with the social aspect being her priority with her friends, right? <laughs> but she does like football. But anyway, I say all that to say to kind of pay the picture. I looked down, and then I locked eyes on her beautiful brown eyes, and I remembered I'm here with her. And so my point is, even when we're not together, stay connected to people in your hearts. Realize that people matter, and when you make that a priority of encouraging each other and thinking about each other and praying for each other, then we can live a full life and leave a legacy of truth. Amen? Amen. Bless the Lord. Please stand. I'd like to say a prayer of blessing over you, my family, my friends. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in God's grace. You are dismissed.